All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I'm Jason Green. Today, my guest is Paul Shortino. I have known Paul since he's moved to Las Vegas. It's got to be over 10 years now. And Paul is one of those great guys who is always down to help. He's always ready to get involved. When we needed guest singers, Paul's the first one to do it. When we had charity events, we needed to raise money. Paul was the first one to come out and sing. We did Toys for Tots. We had to get uh, gifts for kids. Paul would come out and play acoustic. Whatever it took, he was that kind of guy. Guy you can depend on. Still a guy you can depend on because he's here today. And we are going to talk about This is Spinal Tap because you know he's Duke fame. And we got to make this go fast because he's got to go wait for the limo. He can't just sit around wasting his time doing interviews all day long. He was also in the band Rough Cut, Quiet Riot. He's currently in the band King Cobra. And he has plenty of other things to talk about. So we're going to get to all that and more right after this. All right, here he is, Paul Shertino. How are you, Paul? I'm doing great. How about yourself, Jason? Good, thank you. I'm glad that you were able to do this. Ah, it's my pleasure. Anything for you, always. I appreciate it. Um, so, so Paul, we're gonna, we're gonna. There's a lot to get to with you, so we're gonna move along. Because, like I said, you gotta get ready to wait for the limo. Uh, <laughs> so you're from Ohio, and yes. your family. You, you were playing a little guitar and a little bass as a kid, and your family was sort of musical. But your parents separated, and you moved to Glendale, California. And what I find amazing is you were starting to play venues before you were old enough to get into them. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, I was going to junior high and uh, my mother was working in a club called Under the Ice House and another uh, club called uh, The Copa. The Copa was on Glendale Boulevard and Broadway. And, um, the, and the other one was on Brand Boulevard under the Ice House. So under the Ice House at one time was connected to the ice house in Pasadena and my mother was working as a waitress. So we were able to play and go into a room because we were chaperoned. We had an adult that was on the premises. So about 16 years old, I was playing in bars and uh, met a guitar player at junior high that was playing stuff like Joe Pass. And he was into the jazz saying, and so I figured I'll play bass and sing. So I started playing bass and singing, and we actually started playing in these clubs in Glendale and uh, as a trio with a yeah. drummer that was 27. I was 16. Dave Smith was 17. So uh, it was it was a cool time. We were going to all the love ins, you know. I think it was probably 1968, 69. You know, a yeah, long time ago. <laughs> well, for sure. But, uh, but Paul, so I got to say, everyone knows you're a movie star for being Duke fame. And we're going to get to that. But long before you were a movie star in This is Spinal Tap, in 1969, you appeared in a legendary movie. And there it is called The Stewardesses. Oh, my God. Yes. You got to yes, explain yes. how this happened. <laughs> well, um, the club under the ice house that we were performing at um, actually came in and wanted to film part of their, just a scene there. It was just, it was two of the stewardesses showing up to have a cocktail in the bar and we were playing while they walked in. Well, we didn't know what kind of film it was. So we had signed a release form. And I think we made $15 off of our appearance. Well, then we had to go to like a pussycat theater with one of our parents. So we went with Dave's mom and dad to see our part in a movie, which was halfway through the film. And it was a 3D porno. So uh, we didn't really know what we were getting into. So uh, yeah, that was, <laughs> uh, that, was, that was one of my first early film it sounds moments. like something that would happen on like an episode of Three's Company. You know what I mean? It doesn't oh. sound real. We accidentally 
ended up in an adult 3D adult movie. Oh, I, I tell you, it was, and we had to sit with Dave's parents. In fact, finally, his father got up and went across the street and had a beer, and we had to sit there with Dave's mother. And then it cost <laughs> us, it cost us $10 to get in. Mm -hmm. to see the movie we didn't get any free ones you know it's interesting just not too long ago they had got a hold of me and asked if i wanted to do a red carpet in a hollywood uh with all the people that were in this film you mm -hmm. know i could just imagine what some of these people look like you know you can get to 10, 30 you can get years to later that. yeah <laughs> Well, this movie, though, is it's funny because this is a kind of a cult status movie. It's been re-released 40th anniversary and whatever we're on now. But it and it comes with 3D glasses. And, yep. and this is a soft core movie by today's standards. Oh, by, yeah. Oh, yeah. But by it was, it was it was X X rated back then. It got kicked out of San Francisco or something. It was crazy. What was the song you played in the movie? I think we were doing "Girl from" oh, we were doing blue a blues song. It went and went from you know what's really interesting is that we had did this and then they got a hold of us to re shoot some other stuff six months after the film was was released. So we went back and they we showed up in different clothes and they wanted us to find the same clothes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whatever happened to that footage, or even if they used it or what. But we got to get paid another fifteen dollars. I don't know if it was a stewardess too uh, that they put out, and maybe I don't even know about it. But uh, yeah, we had to go back and get our clothes that were in the first one and put them on, and our hair was longer. So it was. I don't. I don't think they used the footage. <laughs> how 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 funny! And it is one of those things where you're a kid in the '60s playing rock and roll, and what a strange, you know. And a lot of strange things happen in your career, but what oh, a way yeah. to sort of uh, kick things off, uh, so to speak. So let's talk about during this during the seventies. Now, what what are you doing musically? Well, actually, in the seventies, uh, probably nineteen seventy, I got a record deal with Bell Records, and I don't normally talk about it because just recently somebody had sent me the forty five. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a promotional copy. And then I did an interview with someone else and they said, hey, I have an MP3 of it if you'll send me some of your new material. So they swapped me out the CD or the, the MP3. And then I do have now the 45. And the song was called Follow Me on Bell Records. Wow. And it was- Mickey Dolan's daughter, Mickey right? Mickey Lauren, yes. Mickey Dolan's daughter was- uh, or no, it was his sister. Sister, oh, sorry. Sister, no, no, his sister Coco, and uh, and it was really funny because right the day that we cut, she she wouldn't do it. So we brought in a girl that later got signed or had a record coming out called JoJo. So it was supposed to be Paul and Coco, and with Mickey's sister, and we did the demo, and we did. But when we came to cutting the track, and Snuff Garrett was the producer who did the Sunny and all the Sonny and Cher stuff, Liza Benelli, you know, big time producer. I go in, there's Fats Domino's drummer, and I'm, you know, this young kid from Ohio, you know. <laughs> you know, playing in, in clubs in Glendale there where there's no dancing, you know, dancing and was outlawed. Core, <laughs> and softcore porno movies. Yes, yes, exactly. And so anyways, uh, Vicki Lawrence, came out with a song, that's the night that the lights went out in Georgia. Yeah. And my record was 22 with a bullet. And boom, they shelved it really quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when yeah. she came out with her song, they put everything behind her. And that was the end of my 45 career. And uh, so then I kind of played around LA for quite a while, ran into, uh, a guy named Claude Schnell who had a band called magic. And so I was being managed at the time by uh, a guy named Kim Manners and uh, Dennis Gleason. And Kim was, uh, his family was affiliated with the movie industry. He was a director, assistant director for Charlie's angels. His dad was the uh, first guy to take a show on, 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 
actually location, which was Route 66. Mm -hmm. So his dad was the director of Route 66. When he got, when Kim got married, I got to meet all the angels, everyone from Jacqueline, nice. Cheryl Ladd, Farah. You know, it was kind of really cool uh, playing at his wedding and meeting all of these stars and and all the people that were giving the goodies to the stars. You know, sure. Uh, and uh, so <laughs> those kind of things. But uh, anyways, then uh, I I was kind of living with them and and going in the studios my my parents had a studio that we put together and so i was doing a lot of recording and uh then uh, all of a sudden i got to uh, meet ronnie james dio through uh dave alford uh, who i had gotten in uh, the band rough cut uh with claude Schnell, joey christofanelli and i don't i don't remember the original drummer but dave came in and we had uh, been rehearsing at Kim's house at that time. And when Dave came into the band and he brought in a guy named Bob Delellis and then Bob was the first guitar player in Rough Cut. And then uh, we actually, uh, David brought in Jake, Jakey yeah, Jake Lee William. Lee. Yeah, Jakey Lee. And then, uh, so we started rehearsing and we did a few rehearsals actually at, uh, before the D.O.s got involved, uh, we did a few rehearsals at the Starwood when that whole thing was coming down with the Wonderland thing, which was really interesting because the place was closed and we're, we're rehearsing there for 10 bucks an hour. And uh, in the middle of the whole place, because it was all locked up and closed down. Was, so that a place that was, was that a place that was owned by Eddie Nash, who was like really involved in the, he, yes. in the Wonderland murders? Yeah. Yeah. Really, yes. you're, you're really in this crazy time in history. Oh, no doubt. And I, I, when I saw that movie, it, it brought back memories of, wow, we were doing this in that place and rehearsing there when this was all coming down. You know, Eddie Nash had been robbed and, and John Holmes was involved in this whole thing. And, you know, that just went over my head. You know, we were just more concerned about, hey, we're, we're rehearsing at the Starwood. Mm -hmm. We know all this stuff's going on, but and going down, but you know, hey, they'll sort it out. What's really cool is that we're only paying ten dollars an hour to rear some to start with. Right, we got a deal. And had the had the big PA in there, and it was great, you know. So um, actually, I was with a band doing a top, top forty stuff in in Redondo Beach, and I met Ronnie James Zio and Benny, uh, a piece. And um, no, I think it's Benny Apice and Carmine. I was just going to say I didn't want to correct yeah, you, but and, well, you Carmine know what? Then, then there's and Frank, Frank Apice, you know, and the Apice older the the other brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, uh, yeah. So it was it was it was uh, Benny and uh, Ronnie came down, and um, next thing I know, Ronnie was taking us in the studio and we were doing some demos. I wish Ronnie would have produced the first Rough Cut album. Even though Tom Allen, you know, I was honored to be recording with him, but uh, our record would have come out sooner. Mm -hmm. I think that would have made a lot of difference because, and it would have might have been a little raw, kind of like the Holy Diver album. Um, and um, I think Ro uh, Rough Cut would have had a bigger impact. We waited a year after Rat had released a record, you know, their album, and also Motley Crue. But Rough Cut had, you know, been signed and we could have been on that that door that opened, you know, because timing's everything. So we waited a time. year, waited a year, and we were on like Ronnie's tour and toured with the Crocus and Accept. And, you know, we had some great tours, but the record wasn't in stores, you know. Uh, they stamped a label on it that um, it was the... Uh, uh, I think a Tipper Gore put, you know, some kind of sticker on this, you know, don't let your children see that. <laughs> don't yeah. let your children uh, listen to this music, you know? So uh, we, we really didn't get a good shot. You know, we had a great tour, but we really didn't get the timing is everything and, 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 and the music business and, and movies and everything. I think uh, well, I, I don't <clears throat> go ahead. 
I was going to say a lot changed for you at this time because obviously before the records have been made, Jake E. Lee gets the gig with Ozzy. So, yes. um, you know, replacing Randy Rhodes after he passed. So things are changing for you. And, you know, so while some things are really great, you know, Ted Templeman, Van Halen fame signs you guys. Um, there's other parts of the puzzle that are moving. Well, yeah. What had happened was is that here we were and we did some – showcases in Burbank studios. Um, Jake had left the band and got a gig with Ozzy, which no one would ever blame him for, you know, and then gosh, you know, and that, that's just like, that's a dream come true for a guitar player. And uh, so he got the gig and then we, uh, we actually found Craig Goldie. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we had joined, actually Craig came um, yes, Craig came first with uh, Chris Hager and Matt Thorne, who had a band called Sarge. And um, we formed both bands together. And um, it didn't, I guess then Craig got an offer. We did a gig and we're still doing demos and stuff. We haven't gotten signed. And Craig, um, we did a video of Taker and Craig wrote the, the lick. Da, 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 da. That was his part of the song. And we wrote a song around that whole vibe because it was so, so just out there. It was such a catchy lick. And Ronnie took us in the studio. We, we did some recording. And uh, we actually, in that time period before this record, we did, we were on the greatest. Uh, the best bands of from the troubadour you know they right. put is out K that is that klos fm that yeah that that there was another the best of the troubadour then there was a klos rock for riches uh contest that we had won and jake was on those songs hmm. used and abused was on one and try a little harder was on the other one and so then um craig we do a, a gig with Dio at the Santa Monica Civic and it's a sold out show back. He does two shows back to back. They sell out, clear everybody out. So we warmed up and Craig got an offer to go and join Jafria. So he leaves the band and now it's Chris Hager, myself, Dave Alford and Matt Thorne and Amir Durak comes into the picture. He's in the band for about two weeks and boom, we get signed. We do a showcase with Ted Templeman and Tom Wally and boom, we get a deal with Warner Brothers. And at the last minute, we came up with this artwork. Uh, I think Matt Thorne came up with some of the ideas for this artwork with the, you know, the heart in the middle and the knife. And it's funny because it, it has this, this look about it but inside the record it was nothing like that <laughs> right yeah it's funny it wasn't how, as heavy it wasn't as heavy as it looked you know yes it's funny how incestuous the, your band rough cut was with rat because some of the, matt and chris coming in and out of the old versions of rat jakey lee as well and then yep. later dave with alfred, alfred too Even yeah oh alfred right and, and 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 rock and dave was in rat before flopster yeah, yeah. And so it's, and then later with Dio, you know, uh, yep. Claude and the other people that you mentioned, and then, uh, you know, there's just so much involvement. And you have some really big highlights, though, at this time, playing the forum with uh, Doc in and Dio. What a dream come true. I mean, you really paid your dues. Oh, well, you know, it's really a trip is I saw Led Zeppelin at the forum and I said, one day, I really want to play here. And actually, it was just after our record had come out. We did one gig before in San, uh, I think it was, no, that was the first gig right after the record. And then we did, the next gig was in uh, Bakersfield. But, uh, but uh, yeah, that was, a, that was our first gig right after we did the album, which was, wow. a, which was a trip. So, and, and I wanted to get signed to Warner Brothers. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, you know, it just something to do with all the movies I watched, you know, and some of the bands that were on Warner Brothers, ZZ Top, uh, you know, uh, Van Halen. There was they had quite a roster, you know, of people on there. Um, and, I, you know, it was like a dream come true. 
uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes when you get on such a big label, you get lost. And I think that's what happened with Rough Cut. We'd find, you know, we'd go to and find and go into a city where we have to do an in-store and our rep would be there and he would be on top of it. And then some guys, you know, just didn't even know that the band existed on, on, on Warner Brothers, you know, so. And, all, you know, it, 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 we lost uh, Tom Wally, who was our A&R man right when we got signed. So that, that, that had a lot of issues. He left and went to Capitol. And uh, Ted Templeman couldn't uh, do our record. He was in the middle of doing a record with Eric Clapton and Lindsey Buckingham. So we had to search for a, a year for a producer. And uh, that's when... Uh, I had just recently found out from Angelo right after Ronnie had passed that they really were let down that they didn't get to do the record. And I, I think it would have been, the timing would have been better. And I, I think the record would have been, would have been a little different than yeah, this record. For those, for those who On don't the production know, end of it. Yeah, Angelo or Curry, he uh, engineered uh, all of the, the Dio, the famous Dio albums. And he actually yeah. was John Lennon's last bass player as well. And, uh, you, you know, worked with you for a lot of years as well and was, you know, very close to Ronnie. So it would have been great if that team would have been in, involved in this. Oh, um, yeah. Record. It really would have been because, you know, we were, um, we had already been working with Ronnie off and on. So we had a rapport in the studio. I think Wendy was afraid that um, um, Ronnie would have been too much of an influence on my voice to mm. sound like Ronnie. So maybe that's why she wanted an outside producer because some of the demos that we were doing, I was, <laughs> I I was great at emulating anybody because I was playing in a for years in in in, in you know uh, a cover band you know yeah. doing cover songs. So <laughs> you got to sound like Steve Perry on this one. Oh, you got to sound like you know Joe Lynn Turner. You got to sound like this guy or that guy. You know, so you you find yourself adapting which was great for me except that it uh when i got in the studio with ronnie ronnie said to me we need to find paul you know so it was uh it was kind of kind of an interesting journey yeah and seeing I mean, how my parents had a recording studio now i've got it in my home which now i'm a little you know i i can really hone in on what i'm doing and find out if i like this or i like that and sometimes you can find yourself being a little lazier than if you were recording with someone else, they can maybe push you a little further than you yeah. will probably go in your own studio. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, your, in later years, you really did figure out how to do it yourself, which was smart. And, and we'll, we'll get to that. You know, yeah. you, put, you put together your own yeah. studio and start producing your own music. But so we should point out that Wendy Dio uh, managed you guys at this point. I don't yeah. know if we said that. You know, and so yeah, no, she was managing Ronnie, and uh, she uh, she helped Jake get his gig. She got him the audition with the um, Ozzy issue, um, and Craig Craig Goldie was just uh, you know he was in Rough Cut at the time, and we had did a show, and um, actually, I was hit up by someone in the Jafria camp. Prior to that, we did a gig with a band called Joshua back then. There were a lot of bands that were in that time period that really were great bands. That uh, that whole Hollywood scene was really cool. I, I, I actually was didn't get involved in it earlier enough, you know, until later. I was I think I was in my probably I was thirty something when uh, 31, 32 when I hooked up with the all of this stuff i kind of stayed out of the hollywood scene and played all around la trying to make a living and <laughs> yeah, you, know, and, you know playing cover songs and then all of a sudden you know you, know, you find someone who knows somebody and here i uh, next thing i'm with the do's and we're going through the contract that i have with these friends of mine which is um you know the manager who was you know, I played at his wedding and met all of the angels. And uh, he's also my son's godfather. And now I present this contract to the Dio's and they go, wow, they, they own everything. 
that, you know, so we got to get you out of this contract. And it's like anybody, if you take something to an attorney, they're going to, the attorney is going to do the best for their client. They're not going to think about, oh, well, you know, their family and they're going to do the best for the client. And so they did. And without me taking it to an attorney, I signed in good faith. And then, you know, they owned, you know, pretty much everything and anything that I, I, if I were to become a multimillionaire, they would own half of it or whatever the, the, the circumstances were in that paperwork. I just, you know, I found myself. So the next thing I found out while I'm getting out of this contract is that Ronnie and Wendy, you're going to come and live and, and, and stay with us for a while till we get sorted, the sorted out. So I got to stay with them and go through that whole period of, watching them put the band together for Holy Diver album and the artwork and hear some of the demos when Ronnie would come home. And at the same time, I was working still in a cover band in Redondo Beach and rehearsing with Rough Cut so and doing demos. So I was still you know, doing my thing and making a living and uh, had a uh, two or three year old son that I had to you know, I was dealing with and a divorce and all of that stuff. And so uh, then all of a sudden, boom, we get signed to Warner Brothers and, and, and life seems like, oh, God, everything's going to be great. Boom, boom. We go on the road. Everybody, uh, everybody's making money but the band. Right. <laughs> you occupation know, uh, of the time, yeah. You know, but that, that's just the way the business is until you get to a point where, you know, they're playing your music nonstop on the radio. And, uh, you know, that's so we roughed out that first album with Ronnie on the road and did some great gigs. And we actually went out first with Crocus and Accept and then picked up a uh, tour with the Accept on the West Coast. And while we were touring with Accept, the first album had so many slow songs that we thought we would do on the second album, a little bit more up tempo stuff. And that's when this record rough cut Two, came out. Uh, once you, and, uh, off of this record also, we ended up doing a, um, a little cameo on, uh, that TV series fame. Oh, right. And, uh, they took one of the songs off of here, uh, want to be a star and used it in one of their episodes. So uh, it was kind of interesting. Here we were back on film again, which I wasn't too crazy about anyways. Uh, even doing the videos, I wasn't always crazy about our, our videos. And uh, we were, we were on this red, white, and blue thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Very patriotic. Double Trouble was the uh, video for that album. And uh, then we did, uh, then we actually, uh, I think we did a uh, tour in Japan where we uh, were on these, uh, this bill with uh, Foreigner, I think was on the bill. Uh, the headliner was Sting and it was an all day festival where they bust everybody in at 6 p.m. and at 6 a.m. the next morning, people were allowed to leave. And uh, I think that might have been in between this record and the other record, but they were very, it was very close. And it was called Japan Aid, like they needed aid. Japan was killing everybody in the economy that, at that time. I remember going over there and being able to buy little TVs and little things over there, gadgets, but they weren't as cheap as they were when the first time we went over, because we went over right after the first record and did a little bit of touring and uh, was on a, a festival. And uh, the second time we went over, of course, everything was booming. Their economy yeah. was booming. And so was <laughs> all of the uh, little electronic gadgets that you couldn't get in the US yet. <laughs> you brought over your red, white, and blue though. Um, oh yeah, 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 we did. In fact, uh, when this record came out, we did the uh, Reading Festival mm -hmm. and we were touring with Saxon. And we were touring all of the dates just in jeans and T-shirts. And we did the Reading Festival and 
Wendy said that we should all wear our red, white, and blue uh, outfits. And um, I spent half the time just trying to knock piss bottles out of the air and fruit. I could see them piling it up. And, and, and on one side, they'd pile up a bunch of fruit and, and bottles, plastic bottles that they'd piss in or whatever. And they they would throw stuff at you if they liked you, and they would throw stuff at you if they hated you. So after the show, I ran into a few guys that I noticed that were out front throwing stuff. And I didn't know at the time that I had gotten very sick, and I was fighting a fever and everything. In fact, I think I did the show. I I had a fever of 105 or something. And... um, Later, when we got back to America, I had gotten hepatitis B somewhere oh. on the road. So I had asked these guys who were throwing stuff at us. I said, hey, why don't you go stand out there and let me throw some stuff at you? Because I tell you, we could have played a lot better if people weren't throwing stuff at us and we were dodging stuff. I mean, it was it was hysterical. And then they said, well... These guys had shared with me that, well, this is what we do at this festival. It doesn't matter. I remember, I think it was Ronnie Dio telling me that when Black Sabbath performed at Donington, they, uh, Geezer Butler got hit, hit in the head with uh, a bottle or, or a can of something and split his head open. So, uh, yeah, it's something that they, they, uh, they do on a regular basis, it seems like. They yeah, like to throw it. stuff at people. What a, what a welcome. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's yeah. And, and it would have probably, we probably would have been better off uh, at that show. And it was interesting because the outlaws were on that show headliner with Saxon, uh, who was, uh, I think simply red went on just before we went on. John Waite was on the bill. I mean, it was a three day festival and it was um, pretty much, uh, a sausage fest out front. There weren't a whole lot of good looking chicks out there. I mean, you know, yeah, maybe on that, on that, we were on the third day. So I don't think on the third day, three days of rain, it was, it was a bit of a, it, it, it's, it's rock and roll at its finest, you know? Uh, yeah. I found it. <laughs> I, I should point out this record is produced by the legendary Jack Douglas, right? Yes. He, yes, he did produce this record. Cool. And uh, Jay, Jay Messina, uh, I think it was uh, Jay Messina, uh, it was the engineer. They did the Aerosmith uh, records. Yeah, Toys Aerosmith. in the Attic. And uh, he also did uh, John Lennon. He uh, yep. was with Lennon the night he got, they dropped him off at the Dakotas. And right after they dropped him off, that's when Chapman uh, had, uh, they were in the studio. And <clears throat> Jack had shared with me the reason why uh, they had picked him. He was known for his editing skills. He could cut stuff up and make, you know, apple pie out of lemonade. You know, I mean, it was amazing what that man could do cutting. So basically when uh, he worked with John, he would cut stuff together just like uh, you know, on, um, the night cries out for you. There's a line. There's a loneliness I feel. Well, I didn't sing that. I sang that at one time. He would have me cut numerous tracks, and then he would take what he what he liked. So I'd go in and sing a song. I'd never sing anything the same way, and it's hard even today. I I seem to. Uh, I'm not real good at doubling. And a lot of producers said, well, your voice is so thick, you don't really need the double. And so I've done it sometimes, but I've, I've, I'm just one of those guys that I never sing something the same way twice. And uh, so Jack noticed that. So he would just, you know, he'd have me sing it four or five, five times. And then he would, you know, the melody that he wanted to use. It was really interesting working with him. I remember yeah. I sat around all day waiting to cut my first track. You know, they spent days and days in the studio and, and now I'm going to get the track and I, <laughs> I've been waiting all day. And as soon as I get there, they go to dinner. And I go, this is great. You know, all I can see is that 
here we're just paying for studio time you know it's coming out of the bands you know money so they i'm sitting around and they went to, just as i get there they go to dinner so i'm waiting around they come back from dinner and now i'm ready to sing i've been dying to sing forever and we're gonna do rock in the usa is the song so my phrasing on this is totally different than it is on the record now because jack comes in and now i go i'm ready i'm ready to sing so i go out and i sing about four or five lines he says come in here come in here and i go inside he goes okay sit down he goes out and gets in front of the mic and he says all right roll it so engineer jay starts rolling it and he's out there going okay paul go home and learn it uh, what do you mean go home and learn it i got the lyrics and everything i, didn't, I wasn't gonna sing it like that he goes no i want you to sing so i went home and I went down, I went, so everybody start your engines, time to get ready to roll. Everybody everywhere tonight, we're going to rock and roll. All the way from New York City, even all the way to L.A. Everybody everywhere is rocking in the USA. So it was like, okay, he did, he gave me the idea of putting like, in the songs like, so here you're putting like pretty much jazz to a heavy metal kind of Judas Priest fill to a you know groove and I guess that's the way Tyler and him work together you know that's, that's the way Tyler works is he does phonetically just <laughs> scatting through some stuff and then he puts lyrics to it well I already had my lyrics and I had to figure out how I could put this story into his I was like okay so adding a little syllable here taking away there i made it work and it was a, it was a really my first lesson and experience with him and it was a great one it was a great learning experience and it was a great first you know i was kind of like irritated that i couldn't sing i was so gung-ho okay it's my turn i've been waiting weeks they've been tracking everything now i get to sing and oh no no, 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 no. I want you to sing it like this. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, got, it was a great experience. He was he was he was great working with. Amazing. Yeah. And so this year is 1986 and uh charities are in, you know, uh we we're, we got to save the world, you know. We are the world live aid. So if you're going to yep. have that, you got to have hearing aid, stars and uh this is a really amazing lineup, and um, so and and this was Dio's charity at the time, and obviously it was a perfect way to get you involved. And I've got to say, I'm sure you've heard it all the time. Your line in the song is the best, you know, the best part. You're the stand. If Bruce Springsteen is the big part of "We Are the World," uh, you're the big part <laughs> of. We Are the World. Oh, I know. Everybody likes my. Uh... And we all need to touch the rainbow. They all love that line. Mm -hmm. I, I know what we all have to sing the whole song and God bless Ronnie. Same way with the guitar players. They all had to play through the whole thing. And, uh, I believe it was Vivian and, um, uh, Jimmy Bain who came up with the chord progression in the song to begin with. And then Ronnie put his, his spin on, on, so they wrote it collectively and, uh, it was one of the most amazing things that I ever experienced because we had just got signed. Um, I think this was after the this was after the first record, not the second. I don't think it was. Maybe it, it came out. Maybe it came out later after after. You yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I, I um, um, or it was right after this the second record, and um, this is where I we all. I mean, we used to hang out like doing the gigs you know doing the, the sunset you know the roxy the whiskey the uh, uh down at the troubadour you know at the time um right before this kevin you know, when rough cut was actually formed kevin was had a band called the bro and he was after randy had left so kevin and i became you know we were friends well <clears throat> we all got really be kind of closer during this hearing aid experience 
um, because people were hanging out and, and it was like, I never thought that I would meet some of these people uh, ever in my life. And here we're doing this project and anybody and everybody who's a rock star is there. And I, I you know, here again, this kid from Ohio, you know, just thrown into this mesh of these guys and, and, and everybody there. Even um, before this went down, I mean, uh, when I was staying with the Dio's, they uh, with the they had finished the album Holy Diver, and they were having uh, Thanksgiving. And uh, you know, I never thought I'd meet Glenn Hughes and 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 all these you know Carmine Carmine Apathy, a piece, that a Apathy. And I'll tell you, they, I, I'm working with him too. So. Uh, <laughs> You think I'd get it right? Uh, uh, so, anyways, I never thought I would meet all these guys: Mark Stein from the Vanilla Fudge, and and uh, Jimmy Bain, and 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 even other other people that were affiliated with Rainbow were were at at the uh, Thanksgiving thing uh, event. And then, you know, this hearing aid thing was just like it was just like unbelievable. He had, you know, Sean, Neil Sean from journey there. You had the t guitar players from iron maiden doing stuff, George Lynch, Don Dawkins, you know, Dave Medichetti, great singer, Rob Halford. I mean, the list goes on of all the amazing Kevin Debro, God rest his soul. Um, you know, there's, a, I think there's only two people that have passed and, and that is Kevin and Jimmy out of the lot that I know of. Um, and um and frankie god rest his soul just recently we lost him and um what a, what an event that's all i can say it was uh, an amazing amazing thing in fact in one of these shots there's a poster that they put and um when i got there to do the background vocals because we did all of the lead vocals were done at rumbo studios and that and the, the all the guitar work and all of the background vocals were at A&M Studios. But Rumbo was uh, actually owned by Captain and Tennille. Wow. Um, so all of, the, uh, all of the lead vocal stuff that you see in that were done in that studio. And we all had to sing the whole song, which is amazing how Ronnie was able to dissect people's lines. And everybody was, you know, they filmed us all doing this whole thing. And uh, for him to be able to pick out the right lines for each guy was, you know, is 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 a talent in itself. And uh, you know, that's what made him so great, anyways. Yeah, and, and that's a, you know a little piece of rock history. I mean, I don't I, at the time I don't know if it was as big as it should have been, but uh, no, I think we raised um, I think we raised uh, a, a little over a million something, and yeah. unfortunately the um all of the rice and and all of the stuff all the proceeds went to the to helping the people of africa the, the only problem was is that the government let the stuff sit on the dock you know you know when you're dealing with uh, ken cragen was involved in that who was involved with we are the world uh kenny rogers manager he was you know ken cragen he was involved in this as well and it's unfortunate that when you're dealing with governments that are corrupt, they're probably all corrupt, including our own, uh, <laughs> you know, greed, you know, God bless, you know, capitalism and, and, and for us to make a good living. But sometimes it brings out the worst in people. So, you know, the corruption. Uh, with making a lot of money and not doing the right things with it. Uh, so uh, I think that was a lot of the issues, even with We Are the World. It didn't get to, to the people like it should have. And I think, I think you should teach people how to fish instead of giving them a fish. Mm -hmm. So at, at one point, those people definitely needed food to get the, give them their strength, but at the same time, the world should be helping people and nations to help them build their nation up and, and and teach them a way to have their own resources instead of you know getting a handout because 
it's better that way when you teach someone how to fish than giving them a fish. Well, it may last longer because you can't always yes. depend on someone giving you something. Sometimes yes. you're going to have to find a way to get it. Uh, yeah. So, um, and I, and for those watching, I haven't forgot Spinal Tap. We're going to double back to that in a bit. But I want to sort of wrap up on Rough Cut because uh, there's a few things about the present Rough Cut, especially that confuse me. But so what happens that makes you guys call it a day back in 86 or when, when it's over? <clears throat> the first time it's over. <laughs> well, I got approached. Rough Cut was ahead of um, Quiet or Quiet Riot was ahead of Rough Cut in Japan. And it was after we did the hearing aid thing and we were touring and um, they got back and I get a call and Kevin and the band parted ways. And so I get a call and they're wanting to know because we had became close doing the hearing aid thing and not so much as because back then everybody was a rival. It didn't matter who you were. You're playing the strip, you know. Whoever was whoever was playing, somebody was a rival to somebody, you know. And 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 that's the way it was at that point in time. So um, they gave me a shout. I went in, did some stuff with them. Uh, we recorded for, did some demos. They tried to kind of keep it quiet because they only actually had one a record to do with Pasha and Pasha had signed quiet riot to um, their label and CBS Sony uh, was a dis distri uh, distribution so they had a they the manager of quiet riot which was at Warren at and then I still was under management with Wendy Dio so we went in and cut some songs once Spencer found out about me. We went in and cut, oh, I think it was three or four songs. And then we went into uh, litigation, renegotiating their deal. They wanted, Quiet Riot wanted it out of their deal with Pasha and, and with Spencer. And so they were trying to keep me, um, you know, keep, keep it hush hush about what was going on with me as the new singer and they didn't want spencer to hear me sing because they would soon spencer would hear me sing then they would probably want to rene renegotiate their deal with pasha and they only were obligated to do one more record so we were just going to do a record and move on to uh cbs or sony sony music and so we went into litigation for a year and uh, did some gigs in Colombia and Japan. In fact, we did a gig in Japan and um, James Brown was headlining. Dio wow. was on the bill, but, but the headliner was James Brown, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to meet him and, and Tommy Ray Brown at the time was married to James. But as soon as James found out they were videoing this, I have this all, I had it on VHS, I dumped it on the DVD. I got to give you a copy of this someday, <clears throat> but um, it's got all the Japanese commercials in between it and stuff. But uh, it was really interesting the the uh, the lineup on there because George Duke, Irene Cara from Fame was on there. Uh, Chester Thompson was playing with George Duke, and um, there was some Japanese pop star that was on the bill, and then Dio was on the show. Uh, Quiet Riot. Um, and then you had James Brown headlining and, uh, it was quite a, quite Great a show. Show. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, anyways, we went into litigation after we got out of litigation then we finished recording a record in that time period. Uh, Chuck Wright left the band and Sean McNabb, uh, Frankie ran into Sean McNabb at the cat house and, um, told him, well, if you play as good as you look, you're in the band. And so we were doing demos before we had recorded the album with Pasha. Uh, and we were in litigation for a year. So we were, were, we were doing pre-production at uh, Jimmy Waldo, who I got in the band um, 
who was in Alcatraz and I got him in, uh, well, I got him to be a part of Quiet Riot. There were only three of us that signed the deal and Sean and um, Jimmy were in the band, but they weren't part of the band. So to what speak. did Jimmy, what did Jimmy do on the record? Jimmy played keys. He helped write some of the stuff. Gotcha. Uh, we were doing uh, all the pre-production in his studio on an Akai 16 track. So uh, Frankie come over and Carlos had come over and because we were in litigation with Pasha. So we had Frankie and Carlos's attorney and management uh, dealing with Spenier, Spencer Proffer and his attorney. And then I had my attorney and manager, Wendy Dio and uh, Stan Diamond as my attorney. So we had all these people negotiating for this record. And boy, we spent a lot of money uh, on uh, attorney fees, getting it sorted out. And we ended up having to re-sign with Pasha for I think another five years or whatever. So they didn't get what they wanted. They wanted to get out. Uh, but however, uh, Pasha owned uh, a lot of stuff uh, from the old record deal they had. So basically when we were in there, they actually got to renegotiate their initial contract, which was, be was a better deal for them and everyone uh, after uh this year of you know letting the attorneys run wild pretty much you know instead of us doing music and then we did uh stay with me tonight video the night uh, actually the uh studios went on um strike so we were doing a video on <laughs> warner brothers lot and there were people outside picketing wow. <laughs> this is kind of interesting yeah, that's and then funny... our first our first gig after this is uh, downing in uh, Columbia. We yeah, you a... played some strange. You were playing some strange places, and there's some live videos on YouTube of at least of the Japan show. Yeah, uh, some DVD version that came out, and uh, and yeah, this record sort of gets lost in the shuffle. But there's some good stuff on here, and uh, you know, there's more uh, members of Quiet Riot in the band here than there are in the band now. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is true. Ooh. This is true. Uh, yeah, there are. I don't even know if there's anybody originally in the band. I mean, I know no. Chuck, 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 Chuck played on a lot of the original Quiet Riot stuff, but uh, That's right. unfortunately, uh, for his for for his history unfortunately uh he was never in the band and he is now yeah i believe uh, well rudy sarzo left for ozzy <clears throat> and when randy rhodes had died rudy was out of work and wanted to come back to quiet riot and they were in the process of making that record and and uh, this is what carlos told me and they so they took rudy back so chuck had recorded a couple tracks but they went back to rudy who was in the band obviously before the ozzy gig and when Chuck left the band, when I joined it, I ended up playing bass because I had played bass. And so we were continued to be, we were able to continue as a trio to work on material. Mm -hmm. So then Rudy came back to Quiet Riot for this album. And we were in negotiations and CBS was just over the top that Rudy was going to be in the band. However, then David Coverdale asked Rudy to join Whitesnake and do the video. I don't know if he was in the band. I just think he was, yeah. um, he was, he was asked to do shoot the video and go on that tour. And, um, what a great break it was for him. Yeah. Um, he's had some, you know, he's, he's had some amazing great breaks and, yeah. and you know what? It, 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 it to show too the he's a good person in his heart so god god has rewarded him in so many ways for being the person he is just he's a good guy yeah and now so while you're in quiet riot were you did you leave rough cut yes i left rough cut 
And actually, um, Perry McCarthy was in the band for a while, who was in a band called Warrior. Mm -hmm. And he replaced me for a little bit. A guy named Joel, I'm trying to think of his uh, not Joel McRae, but uh, um, anyways, it was really weird. We did this thing at uh, after I left the band, and it was a benefit at Irvine Meadows. And this was Rough Cut was going out with them, one of their new, their new one singers they were trying out, and it was myself. Uh, Carlos, Frankie Benelli, Mitch Perry, and I'm trying to think of who was playing bass. Uh, I don't remember who was playing bass, but we did. Uh, uh, I don't need no doctor at Irvine Meadows, and it was a jam. And right as Rough Cut goes out, Perry McCarthy does Days and Confuse, and they sound amazing. And then this other singer that they're trying out comes out and he does a 360 off of the drum riser, but his foot stays stable. So he breaks his foot, his whole ankle. And all I said to him was, Hey, Joel, break a leg. <laughs> I didn't really meant, I have never said it to anyone else ever again. Yeah, he comes off on a gurney, you know, they bring him off. He said, I'm going to sue. I'm going to sue this person, that person. And I'm going, holy Moses, bro. I didn't really mean for that to happen, you know. <laughs> but uh, so basically, yeah, I did depart from the band. And um, they went through some changes um, to where they never actually really re reformed. The band yeah. never reformed. Um, now I know because uh, I was notified by Matt and Amir that we had all made a pack a long time ago. I never, I, even though I had a sign rough cut, I think we did, I did one gig with Jimmy Crespo in San Diego as rough cut with John Homan. And, but the whole project was called Paul Shortino and the cut. The cut, yeah. It, the cut. And there's, there's CDs out there, never was rough cut. And so on the Wikipedia, we have all of this stuff, all of these people that were supposedly in rough cut, were, but weren't. So Jimmy wasn't in rough cut, neither was John Homan. Uh, uh, we did one gig, uh, but- These were more your solo on, records, yeah. Yes, these were from a solo thing where you know, we had, the band was called The Cut, I figured. And we had all made a pack, each one of us, that we would never go out as Rough Cut unless we all went out together. So we did. We did a few reunions. We did yeah. one at the Viper Room. Then we did two Monsters of Rock. The Cruise. And yeah. The Cruises. And uh, we did uh, the party at the Avalon on the West Coast, Monsters of Rock, that was the second one. And uh, so now I hear, you know, I saw a video and I wish them the, all the luck in the world. Cause I, at the time, Dave, Chris, myself, Sean McNabb and Carlos Cavazzo had formed a project called Rough Riot. So I did an LLC and put everybody in, in on it, you know, <clears throat> bad idea, you know, came up with the law idea, the logo. I had a friend here in Las Vegas, Chris Connick, who came up with the logo for me, uh, cool logo. And it was, the idea was to get work. It was never really to record. It was like, okay, let's put part of Rough Cut. Part, I was in both bands. Here, put part of Rough Cut, part of Quiet Riot together, that, and we'll just do songs from both projects. And so this is going on, and then I get a call saying that, uh, you know, uh, from Chris and Dave, that they're not happy with the situation that's going on. And so... Um, I tell them, well, the other guys aren't really happy with the situation either. So I'm, I'm in the middle and being honest 
and everybody wants to go their own way. So we go into this litigation of just to get the name. Well, while I'm getting the name Rough Riot, which I don't probably will never use, but I just, you know, I wanted it back. It was my idea. Just like Rough Cut was my idea. I snagged that idea from Burt Reynolds movie mm -hmm. at rehearsal. Was looking for a name to call the band and went, oh, let's just add another T to this. And this is great. Here, here's some rough tracks. Oh, no, here's some rough cuts, some demos of music. That's how I looked at the name Rough Cut. So that's how I came up with the name Rough Cut. Rough Riot was just another way of taking two bands and putting it together and right. coming up with Rough Riot. So it would, wouldn't be the same if it would have been Quiet Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Rough Riot seemed to be an easier, you know, name to push in from both, from both uh, stables. You know, there were people from the band. So it was really all original players. So anyways... But Dave and Chris wanted to do Rough Cut. And I said, no, it's not Rough Cut without Amir and Matt. It just isn't, you know. And, uh, in fact, uh, the song that they released, I think Matt Thorne wrote most of that song. And he's getting credit, of course. So you're going to be the first to know that uh, we had one in, myself, Amir, and Matt, and recorded some songs. And they're they're going to be released soon on a lay on a label, and it's just the three of us. And special guest is Carlos Cavazo, and I believe the record comes out on the sixth of this month. And does that have a title? What is the band going to be called? It's it's just called Rough Cut, and it has it has our names around a skull, and then uh, in fact I have the album cover and then there's a sticker on there saying special guest carlos cavazo because he played on some of the tracks i have the album cover here and uh i even have the album cover for the new king cobra it's not completed but it's it's really well, i cool. just had johnny rod on the show the other day so believe me you know more than he does about that um, oh yeah uh, but so with so the other guys are claiming that they're playing as rough cut. It seems ridiculous to me. Uh, and well, here's 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 what it looks like, Jason. Here, unless you can I hold on one second. Let me. Uh, it just says rough cut three, and it just has our names on it, and then it uh, it has a triangle underneath it, just as a three, and then we have a sticker, special guest Carlos Cabazzo on it. Okay, so and let's we're giving him. Let's clear up a little bit of rough cut history for everybody. So Chris, who plays guitar, and Dave Alford, they are claiming they have rough cut and they're doing their thing. Now, you, the, the voice of rough cut, and I really can't imagine a rough cut without you, are doing your band with Amir, who was also in the band Orgy. He had a lot of success with Orgy, and then he had success with Chester. Uh, I don't know if it was success, but he had a band with Chester Bennington from yes. Park as well. And then, uh, and then Matt, who played with Stephen Piercy for ages, and he does a lot of production as well. So the three of you have your thing. And then Carlos Cavazzo from Quiet Riot, who is, and Rat, who's a, an amazing guitar player. So, I mean, I know people can choose, but it sure seems like this is Rough Cut, and this would be the band that, if you're a fan, that you want to see. Is this going to end up in some kind of litigation? Uh, you know what? I... I truly wish them the best. And what Amir and Matt, seeing how Amir was in orgy and now he's completely erased. Uh, Jay has erased any kind of history of any of the other members. And, uh, and Amir was a little upset about, because this is part of our legacy. Uh, they've already went in and, um, you know, did whatever they want, you know, because Wikipedia, you can do whatever you want. And, um, so basically, um, we had recorded some songs collectively, and some of these songs are probably going to be on Dave and Chris's Rough Cut. And really, Amir, Matt, and myself, uh, I've just released uh, last year during the pandemic, I released the Shortino CD and had Aldridge on it, Doug Aldridge on it, 
uh, Phil Susan played bass, uh, Jay Schillen played some drums on it. In fact, we did a remake of Send In The Clowns and Benny Paul played the track years ago on it and Marco Mendoza came in and played bass on it and we did a video with Carrot Top. So as I'm doing all of this, we're kind of settling Rough Riot and I don't know that Chris and Dave are going after, you know, an LLC for rough cut. And basically, I don't think, I, I believe the rights are owned, the logo rough cut the, itself, the logo is owned by a record company. So I don't believe, I believe they only have so many rights to use the name. And we just want the fans to know. And why Amir and Matt had called me, and it was Matt initially called me, was to just let fans know that we don't care if they go out as Dave and Chris's rough cut, but that's what it is, is Dave Alford and Chris Hager's rough cut. Yeah. And the rest of us, that's why we release this, because probably some of these songs that we collectively wrote because we were actually thinking about putting another album out with all the original members. Mm -hmm. They got upset when they saw the video came out because Matt had written a lot of that song, Bed of Black Roses or whatever, whatever their video is. And what's interesting is that Stephen St. James was the singer in Sarge back when Matt and Chris had the band Sarge. And Stephen got signed to Motown, so he left the band. And that's how we actually formed Rough Cut with Craig Goldie was we got Matt and Chris who were looking for a singer and a drummer for Sarge. So basically that's how that all came about, how we formed Rough Cut with Matt and Chris. And now it's kind of weird how everybody has come full circle and here Stephen St. James is singing again with Chris Hager and they're going out as Rough Cut. And nobody really asked me to sing in Rough Cut. However, they knew I was doing my own thing with, and if the pandemic wouldn't have hit or whatever, plandemics, you know, whatever they want to call it, <laughs> you know, scamdemic, you know, whatever. I know people have died from this thing, but, uh, it ruined a lot of people's lives during this whole thing. And uh, there were a lot of festivals that we had lined up for my for my solo record. So, you know, I was more concerned and just, you know, getting through all of this more litigation because we were going through this litigation on Rough Riot and they went behind everybody's back and did an LLC for Rough Cut. So... I don't know the legalities of all of the stuff that's going on. I know that Amir and Matt are looking into all the prospects. I don't think there's anything that they can do about uh, this release of this album that's coming out. Um, in fact, it was a fan who, ha who is a big Rough Cut fan is upset that they were doing this. And, and I really, I'm doing a record now with Carmine again, a King Cobra record. And I've been working the last two years also with a um, guitar player, um, Tracy G, who worked with Dio. And we're yeah, doing I, like a. I think he's we're doing be on a. Netflix. We're doing. We've been we've been working on like a heavy blues, uh, kind of Gary Moore meets Led Zeppelin record. It's some amazing stuff, Jason, that we've recorded, and I can't wait to release it. We have a we have a, a title for the record the album and I'll I'll, um, I'll sh and he might share some stuff with you but I'll, I'll share some stuff with you as well. Yeah, um, I, it, it it sounds great. You you definitely have always stayed busy and which is a great thing and uh, and I'm showing King Cobra here on the screen in 2011. King Cobra uh, makes their comeback. He put out an album. Um, uh, Mark Free said he had. Uh, gender dysphoria during his years. And in, in the 90s, long before uh, Caitlyn Jenner and things, he decided to uh, have transition and he's now Marcy free. 
he was not interested in um, singing King Cobra again, although I heard that they were open to uh, that, but it, it, it wasn't meant to be. And uh, so she is, 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 she has her own band, but for the most part, I think is laying low right now. And they go to you, a great choice. You guys make two King Cobra records and have a, yes. uh, have a third King Cobra record in, in, the, in the works. Obviously things like you mentioned ha have slowed down. Um, yes. But, uh, right but, now, what we're doing is we're in pre-production. We actually have a title for the album. I have to hook up uh, some, uh, I've got to move to hook up some power. I'm so yeah, third King Cobra record on the way. Carmine Apiece, obviously. Uh, Legend, Vanilla Fudge, Ozzy Osbourne. D uh, uh, David Michael Phillips is still involved, right? No, actually, um, the uh, guitar players are uh, Robbie Lochner. And war, uh, actually, Rowan Robertson. Oh, great! Yeah, Rowan's fantastic, and another Dio connection. Yeah. yeah. So, well, and, yeah, and, and, and uh, I guess David didn't want to do the record, and um, Carmine had called. What's really uh, great about this is that we're not doing it on Frontier. We're doing it on Cleopatra, and they're going to give us vinyl, and. Uh, so I guess Carmine has was doing some other business. I'm still shopping. Wendy Dio has been shopping my uh, Make a Wish CD still that I released last year and on Ward Records in Japan. So she's been, you know, trying to get it released through all this COVID stuff here in the sure. states. So there's a um, a track that Ronnie sang on that there's a possibility that it might be going on my solo record that oh I great heard. but um one thing uh is that uh like i've been working with tracy but the king cobra thing carmine called and um i i've been working with tracy for a long time i didn't really want to defer from that you know i've been doing my own thing and and getting getting a lot of the right connections and the right people to help me get my projects or whatever I'm doing solo stuff out there. But the, the Tracy G thing, it just, uh, we connected and it was just out of the blue. He gave me a call. And, uh, and so I didn't really want to do the King Cobra and, and get away from, we're almost done with the record me and Tracy working on. So, and I asked Tracy if he wanted to do this and he said he would if I was doing it. And then, but he, he said he wasn't really into doing the 80s stuff. And then we find out through Cleopatra's that we don't have to do the typical uh, frontier 80s kind of record. So this record, uh, the title of it is um, Music is a Piece of Art. And it's uh, it's really cool, the album cover. It's and then it's cool that they're going to do vinyl because it's it is the cover is a piece of art. And again, my friend, who's a tattoo artist here in, in Las Vegas, Chris Connick, and he also is in a heavy, you know, a heavy metal band, uh, is a tattoo artist. And I asked him, you know, would you be interested in checking this out? And and so we wrote a song. There's a title track called "Music Is a Piece of Art." So it's it's really it's really cool. Some of the materials really. Uh, it's going to be different for that's King great. Cobra. Yeah, it's, well, it sounds like you you're definitely busy. It's different now than it was before. You had to kind of be in one band. Now you can do different projects. It's the only way to survive, to be honest, for, for most to do different projects. Yeah. Uh, I can't let you go. You know, the limo is going to be here any minute. Uh, we're probably overdue, but I can't let you go without talking about this is Spinal Tap. So, uh, what an insane part of your life. The story I hear is that it's 1983 probably, you're at the Troubadour wearing a similar outfit and a casting director approaches you. Is this true? That's the exact outfit I wore to the gig and I wore it to casting. And the girl that's on my arm was actually Jackson Brown's girlfriend. And wow. he let her go for Daryl Hannah. And I got to hear about it all day long. And it was all ad lib. I had bought that outfit myself. 
I, I still have the coat and the boots. A girl, I gave a girl the pants to uh, do some alterations and never saw them again. So uh, I showed up. It was, it was the funniest thing. Uh, didn't know what they were saying. Didn't have a clue. All I know is, is that at lunchtime, I was trying to sell rough cut songs to Rob Reiner for the movie. And he goes, well, kid, we've got them. My girl's got them, big bottoms. We've got the songs. They're all satire and blah, 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 blah. And uh, so, yeah, what, what, a, you know what? Somebody saw, Jake was in the band at the time. Somebody saw an ad in, in one of the, uh, I think it was BAM, uh, which was a newspaper, local newspaper in Los Angeles at the time, and saw that we were playing the Troubadour and came and I, my, my, myself, Jake and Dave were all called for the casting call. I showed up first dressed in white in my black uh, suede boots and they went, there's Duke fame. And I got the gig. That's how I got the gig. And I got my SAG card. So yeah. every, once, every once in a while, I'll get a little money and then the mail from it. Which is so ama amazing, you know, you're part of history. Uh, you know, so many famous people make small parts in you know, that movie. We could go on forever, you know, Billy Crystal, Fran Drescher. And then of course oh, the, the, the so main cast, people. Michael McKeon, uh, Harry Shearer, Christopher Guest, directed by Rob Reiner, Howard Hessman from WKRP in Cincinnati in, as your manager. And Paul Benedict, he was behind his, he was the desk clerk. From the Mr. Jeffersons. Bentley from the Jeffersons. Yeah, he's only yeah, as God yeah, made him. Yeah. And you know, we were on the road and we couldn't even get a line check. And that movie had come out, right? And we're out with it just after Rough Cut got signed. We're out and because that was made before we were signed. And we were just we just got signed after I did this movie. And so now we're out on the road and we can't get a line check. And we're warming up for except who's warming up for Crocus. And we're on the East Coast and no line check. Just get up there and play. Just get up there, plug in and do your thing. And sure enough, the, the road manager comes by our dressing room and he just sees me sitting in there. And he goes, aren't you Duke fame? And I went, yeah, I am Duke fame. He goes, well, the guys in Crocus want to meet you. And I couldn't believe this. So I go back and I meet, I'm signing autographs to their movie, right? And they're here, they're here, they, these guys are screaming, and, you know, I mean, they're huge stars, you know, except as freaking blowing doors, right? So we get a line check and we go from domestic beer to Heineken. And it was mm -hmm. like, great. They even upped, upped our stuff in our dressing room. So it was, it was really cool. You know, uh, yeah. got a lot of mileage out of that. I was at the, uh, I was picking up Ronnie and Wendy Dio and they had their own limo company and I had just showed up with the driver to help them with the luggage. And REO Speedwagon's there and they're getting into a shuttle bus and getting picked up. They're on the same flight. So they came over to me and they go, aren't you Duke fame? And of course I said, yes, I'm Duke fame. Wow, and you're getting into a limo, and we're in, where you playing the Normo Dome tonight? I mm -hmm. no, no, this is the Dio limo, you know. Oh, you no, know, but they, I, I've been really blessed. I really have. You got it. So, you, uh, a couple of questions about it. You got to tell me. It's supposed to be in Memphis, but from what I hear, it's a, a Holiday Inn in Burbank. Is that true? Yes, it was a Holiday Inn in Burbank, and it's still there. That's what I was going to ask. Is it still there? It's still there. It's right by the airport. I think I've stayed there before, but now I'm I have sure to go back. Yeah. Sure I got to go have. back and revisit it. Yeah, you need to. It's there still. Every time I go back, I pass it off of the five. It's an a, a, a incredible little piece of history. And it's funny is that you, you sign an autograph, you know, for the girls waiting with like a pencil. Did you write Duke fame? No, you know, I wrote, I don't even remember what I wrote, but I said some other things and they cut it out, you know, of course, you know, I mean, I, I'm just lucky the girl that was on my arm wanted her SAG card and I got it. I got the, uh, when you get to say a line, you, 
that they there's a word for it that you they go they you're you're able to get in sag and right. i was on the gong show before and i uh, i i i wavered that and took the money and i was on the dating game show back when i was 17 on my first record and so wait ho ho hold on paul don't you, you can't jump that far ahead on the gong show you performed yeah before i was signed yeah twice did you get gonged no but i didn't we think got so. beat. no we got beat it was me and a guy named it was Sorensen and shortino and we uh did he don't love you and we're in these jumpsuits and uh, a kid beat us out with the audience participation because his whole class came to see him. So when they did the audience participation thing, you know, the clapping, the kid, the kid won. A sixteen-year-old kid beat us out. And then we were I was on again, and uh, first time I ever uh, I was on the dating game show, which was after I had released that uh, Bell Records follow me. And uh, I missed five days in Hawaii. So for the way for the dating game, you were you the, the bachelor or were you one of the three guys competing? No, I was one of the three guys. And, yeah. I and did you get, get picked? picked? You didn't get picked. No, yeah. no and then well, the other guy that was with me was a, um, a professional ball player. And there was a third guy that had been on there many a times. And he, he was, was a ringer. Old. Oh, yeah, and he was uh, my. And he went five days to Hawaii with a school teacher, and um, I talked most of the time. I told this girl, I think how I, I blew the I blew my, my date was. She goes, so if you brought me home to your house, what would you look like and what would you cook? I says, well, I have a whole lot of hair, so I'd probably look like cousin it, and I would make you spaghetti. And I think that would probably when I said I looked like cousin it. I think that probably blew my chances for going to Hawaii with her. Long picture. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Suddenly the plane <laughs> stopped at the airport. Paul, you've had an amazing career. Uh, and it's funny, like, it's just when I think I know all these things about you. Uh, in, in, after an hour and a half, we get to these gems about the gong show and the dating game. Oh, um, you, you and, know, I don't think I've ever shared that with anybody else but you, I think. I really well, do. I, I, have, I don't think I've ever shared that. I'm so glad you, you shared it. Carmine's, Carmine's girl, well, is pretty much his wife now, and they've been together for so long. Um, she has all, they, they were doing a live gong show. So she has, she had gotten the rights. So they have all of the episodes. I says, you got to find that episode of me on it. And that's just, a, I met Chuck Barris. I mean, that, that was just an hilarious time in my life. Yeah, amazing. From stewardesses, the three D X rated adult movie, to Spinal Tap and the Gong Show and the Dating Game in between, and then what the hell? You're a heavy metal singer, and you have one of the best big blues rock voices around. Paul uh, can't say enough about how talented you are, and I really appreciate you spending this time and 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 sharing your story with people because I know that people would love to hear it. Hey, I'm I'm just so grateful you have me on here, brother. And thank you so much. And God bless you. And uh, and keep doing what you're doing. I think what you got going on is awesome. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And I'm going to link uh, down below so people can go to your website and they can buy some of these records. You got a lot of stuff. They want to buy the stewardesses DVD. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a limited edition of that. <laughs> yeah. So we got to we. All for all things Paul Shortino or Duke Fame, go to the go down below and we'll have it. Thank you, Paul. I hope to see you Thank soon. You, God bless you, Jason, and stay safe. All right, my friend. Thank you. You too.